OK, so remember that you've got to choose one of hazards, ecosystems or resource reliance. And this particular PowerPoint is for ecosystems. So for ecosystems, we need to know um, some terminology. We need to know that an ecosystem is a community of plants and animals interacting with each other and their environment in order to survive. We need to know that a biome is a large scale ecosystem, a large area with similar characteristics. And you need to know that uh, you need to know some certain points about each of those different ecosystems that we've looked at. You need to know that there are biotic living and abiotic non living elements to an ecosystem. So, for example, rocks would be abiotic. Plants and animals would be biotic. You need to know what interdependence means, which is where you've got different elements of the ecosystem that all rely on each other. And if one element is removed, the whole thing collapses. It's a system, it's an ecosystem. So this means that we've got inputs, outputs, sto stores and flows. We've got producers at the bottom of the food chain, so the plants that use sunlight to, through the process of photosynthesis, create energy. And then you've got the consumers that eat the producers and you've got the energy moving through the food chain. We need to know that photosynthesis is where the plants are taking in carbon and using it alongside water and sunlight to produce their energy, their food. We need to know that sustainable, sustainability means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So you need to be able to talk about the tropical rainforests. You need to be able to talk about why they're important and what's happening to them. And we need to have our example of a sustainable scheme. So the rainforests are important because they regulate the atmosphere. They take in the trees, CO2, and they give us oxygen to breathe. So they regulate the atmosphere. They also provide a huge amount of habitats for plants and animals that are only found in the rainforest. They provide us with ingredients that we use in our medicines. There may well be new medicines that are undiscovered in the rainforest. And if we chop them all down, we will never find them. Why are they being chopped down? They're being chopped down so that we can use that land for cattle ranches so that we can keep cattle, keep cows, so that we can produce meat for the, the red meat that we use around the world, which is increasing in demand thanks to McDonaldsization and the growth of burgers and that kind of thing all around the world, even into LIDCs. We also use the land to grow palm oil, which goes into a huge amount of products, including Doritos, for example. So we're clearing the trees so that we can grow those crops because a hectare of trees does not bring us any money into our economy. If we chop down the trees, we can use that land to make lots of money. That's why these countries like Brazil do what they do. There are other things you can talk about, like logging. So using the trees to make furniture and paper. You can talk about mineral extraction, getting at the oil that's under the ground, making dams, that kind of thing. Uh, we also need to be able to talk about the Arctic and the Antarctic. We need to be able to talk about the similarities and the differences. So they're both polar regions. They're both extreme climates. It's cold. They have 24 hours of sunlight for a period in the summer and they have 24 hours of darkness in the winter. They're challenging places. However, the Arctic does have a warmer summer season. Vegetation does grow. The Arctic has millions of people living in it. Antarctica doesn't have that summer season. Antarctica has nobody living there permanently. The Arctic has the tundra. The Antarctic is ice. Um, talking about interdependence in the Arctic. So we can talk about the birds of the Arctic using the moss, the plants to line their nests. 
so they've got a nice cozy nest against the cold. You can talk about how the humans use the animals to make their clothes so that they can keep warm and so that they can have lots of energy from eating the animals. We can talk about the impacts on the Arctic, so cruise ships creating pollution, tourists which is increasing in the area creating noise and litter and camera flashes, mining, overfishing certain species around there and man-made climate change ultimately causing the ice to melt. So you need to be able to talk about a sustainable scheme in the rainforest. So you need to be able to talk about Procura Lodge in Costa Rica. How is it sustainable? So it's sustainable because when they arrive, the guests are given a glass bottle to use so that they don't have to use plastic bottles and we reduce plastic waste. Waste. The chefs use local animals. They will use all of the animal and any waste, they will burn it for heat. 95% of the staff are from the local area, which is socially sustainable. You're giving jobs to the locals. The water is heated by solar panels, so it's renewable energy. They use biodegradable soaps and shampoos. There's a mini hydroelectric power scheme on the local waterfall to create renewable energy. However, it's very small scale, so it's only sustainable for a very small part of the rainforest. Your example of a sustainable scheme in a polar region is Union Glacier in Antarctica. So here we've got sustainable measures such as the tents being heated by the sunlight. You've got 24 hours of sunlight in the summer and the camp only opens in the summer. There are solar panels to run all of their equipment. They use bikes instead of snowmobiles, so there's zero emissions. There are very strict rules. When they come in, they have to check their boots to check that they're not bringing any seeds or alien species into the ecosystem. All of their rubbish and waste has to be removed. It's taken back to Chile. They're encouraged to take very short showers or use sanitizer and sponge baths rather than wash so they reduce their water use however it's a four and a half hour flight from Chile it's the only way you can get there landing on the blue ice runway which obviously creates carbon emissions to actually get there so it's not completely sustainable the global sustainable project is the Antarctic Treaty this is signed in 1961 by 46 countries, saying that the Antarctic will be a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. There will be no military activity. Nobody will lay claim to it. Nobody will own Antarctica. Any visitors will follow very strict rules. They won't get closer than five metres to any wildlife. They won't take flash photos. They won't remove any of the flowers or rocks. They won't leave any litter behind. And actually, it has been one of the most successful international agreements of all time. And it's really remained a wilderness. Scientific research that we're able to do there is extremely important. And it's able to take place because it's unspoilt and untouched by humans. And it's really important to aid our understanding of climate change. But the treaty will end in 2041. Will it be modified? Will it completely end? And it's a free for all. OK, so you've got your Procura Lodge case study, Union Glacier case study, Antarctic Treaties case study. Now you need to be able to talk about the different ecosystems. So the grasslands, if it says grasslands, it means savanna. Savanna is Lion King country. Savannah grassland is where you've got distinctive wet and dry season. Any plants and animals that survive there have to be able to get through that long dry season where there's very limited water and food and get to the wet season where they can take on board energy and water again. You might be asked about the coral reefs. Coral reefs, remember, only grow in shallow water because they need the sunlight to penetrate through so that photosynthesis can take place. You've got a huge biodiversity down there. You've got seagrasses, you've got uh, Nemo, so you've got your clownfish and that kind of thing down there. 
Um, rainforests we've talked about. Rainforests, the animals and the plants there need to be able to cope with very high rainfall every single day of the week. They need to be able to, talk, to cope with the huge dense vegetation that they find themselves in. So they need to be able to climb the trees or they need to be able to exist on the forest floor. Remember, you've got the distinctive layers in the rainforest. You've got the floor, you've got the shrubs, you've got the understory, you've got the canopy, and then you've got the emergence sticking out the top looking for sunlight. Each of those layers is a different microclimate. They're very different. The floor is cool and damp, whereas the emergent layer is very hot and gets a lot of rain. The nutrient cycle is in the rainforest where the leaves of the trees fall off the trees, they fall to the ground and they decompose. The nutrients then go into the soil. The trees then take up the nutrients from the soil to grow big and strong. And then the leaves fall off again. In the rainforest, the nutrient cycle is extremely fast. That is what sustains the huge number of plants and animals that live there. If we chop down the trees, the nutrient cycle stops and rainforest soil is inherently extremely poor quality. If you don't have that rapid nutrient cycle, the rainforest soil becomes very poor and very little grows very quickly. Uh, the water cycle in the rainforest, the trees intercept the rainfall. The water sits on the leaves and then evaporates straight back into the atmosphere. The rainforests essentially make tomorrow's rain. If we chop the trees down, then we don't have as much rain. The rainforests get extremely dry and even prone to drought going forward. One example of interdependence in the rainforest. The tapir eats the seeds from a plant, walks around and defecates. The seeds are in a lovely bit of poo where they can fertilise and grow. You've got on here looking at the, the Arctic or Antarctic. Some people, some schools study the Arctic, some schools the Antarctic. So they usually talk about a polar region you have studied, either the Arctic or the Antarctic. So it doesn't matter which you talk about. So in terms of what's not come up yet, so interdependence is something, looking at the where the rainforests are located. So remember, they're located either side of the equator in a belt, for example, the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. Deserts, where are they located? Deserts are located 30 degrees north and south of the equator, where you've got high air pressure. The largest is the Sahara in Africa. Um, fauna, remember, is animals, flora is the plants. You've got the water cycle there. You've got why is the rainforest important for the people? Maybe pause this and have a little look at those answers. What are humans doing to the rainforest? Comparing the Arctic and Antarctic. And again, interdependence comes up. So have a little look at that again. And you might get a map showing global distribution. Remember, they will always put things on the map that they want you to use in your answer. So if the equator's there, is it north, on or south of the equator? If they've given you Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, you can use that. Use your continent names and um, try and use specific countries if you can. 